she said, my name is Etanosa Bevoin. I am a graduate student at the University of Missouri in Kansas City, so just literally right down the street. Um, and this is my wonderful professor, so, okay. Um, so I'm getting my master's in education administration in higher ed with an uh, emphasis in student affairs. And like she said, I will be talking about the student rights era and activism in student affairs. So here's an overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'll give a recap of the civil rights era. We'll go over some student protests student affairs professionals' roles in those protests. We'll go over a current student protest, and then we'll review those roles um, going with that student protest and talk about allyship at the very end. So the civil rights era um, was a fight for citizens to have political and social freedom and equality. It happened during the 1950s throughout the 1960s. Um, after the Civil War, um, that which abolished slavery, Black people were still being mistreated. They were still fighting injustices based off their race. And so Jim Crow laws were also enforced. Um, and it, this went into effect to have segregation in bathrooms, water fountains, the back of the bus, people were sitting there, interracial marriage was still illegal. Um, and voting was limited because of literacy tests in schools. Um, Plessy versus Ferguson also was a Supreme Court decision of 1896 that said that spaces could be separate but equal. Um, in that, we know that there were not a lot of funds or resources provided for African Americans in the spaces that they occupied. Um, in the Brown versus Board of Education of 1954, this was the first time the Supreme Court had decided that um, integration needs to happen in our public schools. The Little Rock Nine were the nine people who were escorted with eight schools to the integration schools down in Arkansas. Um, in this, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 was the first time that there was federal prosecution for anyone who tried to prevent someone from voting. So this really affected African Americans because there was a lot of things where they weren't, weren't able to read, and so literally C tests were um, diminishing. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was also signed into law, the second one, and this guaranteed equal employment, the limited use of literacy tests, and integration of public spaces. Unfortunately, white people still thought that this was unfair treatment, that their black counterparts uh, did not need to have equal opportunities or equal rights as them. So during this time, Dr. Martin Luther King was an iconic figure. He led crusades, he had a mission, and he really wanted to integrate all people. Um, we all know his famous speech, I have a dream, it still lives on today. This was also a time where college students became more involved. As they started to get into higher education, they became more educated and more involved in the discussions on how to proceed with the civil rights and movements going on, things that affected them. So we'll talk about some student protests that happened in the 1960s. Greensboro students in the 1960s. So we have four students at North Carolina A&T State University who were denied service at lunch. And after that, they decided they were going to have a peaceful sit-in at the lunch counter. Um, and this was not done uneducated. They had learned about the pra non-violent practices of Gandhi. They had read about the Freedom Rides of 1947 and the mur murder of Emmett Till. And they knew that these injustices were still happening in their uh, society. And so this act inspired sit-ins across the country. Howard University also um, saw their sit-ins and were compelled to do their own protests. Their goals were to have curriculum to be focused on African-American history, um, have a judiciary system involving students, a disciplinary proceedings against students involved in earlier protests that the president resigned. Not all the ones were met, but it definitely opened the door for what students could do. Around the world, students were also protesting. In Warsaw, Poland, they were protesting against government censorship. This one escalated very quickly. It started off with 300 students. In a couple months, there was over 20,000 students involved in these protests. Um, excuse me, I don't know how to pronounce this, Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square um, in Beijing, China. Um, they, students led a pro-democracy demonstration. Unfortunately, these demonstrations ended, ended in Chinese uh, troops coming in and shooting the crowds and killing thousands of people. So 
So we're going to talk about some of the student affairs roles that uh, we have played in campus activism. So in Los Torrentes, um, this was happening and it was starting to fade out towards the 1970s, but as this means just in place of the parents, and so student affairs professionals were acting as parents. They were really restricting the movement, the socialization, um, and the ideologies for students to express themselves. Um, we also occupied the role of disciplinarian, and basically we were trying to keep the peace and maintain order. A lot of the administration felt that this was a necessary role for student affairs professionals to play, to play um, because they had fear of embarrassment and offending the trustees. We also played the role of advocate in supporting students and um, their missions and stuff like that and not allowing their voices to be squashed. But also this was a hard role to play just because we didn't want to compromise the mission of the institution. Um, we also played educator, which a lot of us identify with, and this was to help, during protests, help refine demands and concerns so that students can present it to administrations in a non-confrontational way. We were the mediator because we worked so closely with students and we heard their concerns and heard their frustrations. Um, we knew exactly some of their lived experiences, but we were also part of the administration team. And so because of that disconnect, we were that communication build between the two. And then we also acted as change agents and initiators, creating spaces and experiences for students to challenge the beliefs and ideologies and really have discussions to learn more and open their minds to what could possibly be um, something. Um, so again, that's the death of locals parentis and the birth of student rights movement. So just that shift in um, us being parents to letting them really find their independence and finding their voices on their own. So here is a current uh, protest, I guess not so current, four years ago on the zoo's campus. So we'll just kind of go through the timeline of things that went on. So back in 2010, um, like students scattered, caught involved on the Black Cultural Center. And so I personally had experience, I wasn't on campus in 2010, but I was there in 2014. And so we heard about these stories and it was one of those really degrading moments on campus where we had the black students in front of the BCC uh, picking up the cotton, which really refers back to times of slavery. In August 9, 2014, the killing of Michael Brown happened in Ferguson, Missouri, and that really escalated things and that was the launching of the Black Lives Matters movement. In September of 2015, Susan Head, the MSA president of the university, went onto Facebook to share his frustrations and the injustices that he has been facing. He was being called racial slurs by his counterparts and peers at the school. Shortly after, Chancellor Bowen Lofton issued a statement that the actions were unacceptable. Unfortunately, that wasn't really enough for the students and Peyton Head went on social media again and said that the apology was great, but action really needed to happen in order for change to occur. In October, this was a big month of action or events happening on campus. We had drunken students disrupt the LBC, which is the Legions of Black Collegians um, homecoming party. So at Mizzou, there's two separate homecomings. They have like the black homecoming and the general one kind of thing, just because they didn't feel like they were always included in the general one. They don't represent it. So LBC had their own homecoming court and stuff like that. So drunken students had walked by when they were practicing for homecoming court, again, um, saying racial slurs and disrupting their practice. In 2015, Chancellor Lofton orders diversity and inclusion training for students and faculty. At this time, our student, Jonathan Butler, he was a graduate student at the time, released a, um, a message or an open letter that says that President or Chancellor Lofton's order for diversity and inclusion training was a great start but he was forgetting that there was a lot of black students and black faculty who weren't involved with that training, that he was missing the point, that he wasn't having discussions with people who had lived these experiences. And so in that, it, to his perspective, he missed the mark. In order to get some more visibility, students um, decided they were going to take their issues straight to the president of the UM system, President Wolf. Um, 
And so as he was participating in the homecoming parade, they decided to talk to him directly. And so unfortunately, the car decided they were going to try and bypass the students and ended up tapping one of the students, which caused an outrage. Um, and not only an outrage with his actions, but an outrage with how much force that the police used to clear the streets at the time. Shortly after, this group for Student 1950 was created and listed their demands. The year 1950 was used because that was the first time an African-American student was allowed to come to the University of Missouri in Columbia. Um, some of their demands um, included um, the president resigning. It also included a restructuring of the curriculum and the policies in place that addressed uh, students of color experience on campus. So after these demands were listed, the president met with them, and unfortunately that conversation did not go very well. He did not agree to any of their demands. Of course, that enraged a lot of students, and Jonathan Butler, like mentioned before, decided he was going to start a hunger strike to really put pressure on the administration to make some changes in the university. So student boycotts begin to support Jonathan Butler. So we have students all around campus just walking around, just kind of yelling, no justice, no peace. Students were protesting class, they weren't going to class anymore. So eventually, three days after he started his hunger strike, the president decides to issue an apology um, and then has a meeting in UMKC actually and where students get, I don't wanna say get him, but they <laughs> confront him after his meeting and ask him what systematic oppression is. And his answer was subpar. Um, he basically made it seem that um, people of color didn't know the privilege that they had and the opportunities that they had by being in higher education. So that enraged students. It wasn't until November 8th when the black football players decided to become involved with the protest um, and announce that they won't practice that things started to take some real action. Um, luckily for them, like the teammates and their coaches showed support, which was really great. And then after that, 24 hours after that, Wolf resigned from mm -hmm. his position. So let's take a look at the different roles that each of these players had. So I forgot to mention, let me go back really fast. So during this time in October, um, Professor Melissa Click um, acted as an advocate. She was on the grounds with the students and a reporter came up to her trying to get the story, trying to get the behind the scenes. And she pushed them and said that we needed muscle to remove them from the premises. And it was caught on camera and it went, it made national news on what the roles of professors and faculty were. So in this instance, Mr. Wolf asked an administrator, a lot of students saw administration as the enemy, that they were disconnected from the student body, that they didn't really know what people needed. Um, Chancellor Lofton was the change agent when he decided, hey, let's put an order in for diversity and inclusion training. But he also missed the bar mark when he didn't have those discussions. He was the, probably the closest administrator to have discussions with students, and he just missed that. Professor Melissa Click, as the advocate for this, um, she wanted to create a safe space. She wanted to allow students to really voice their opinion and use their voice to create change. And so in her instance, I think she was practicing professional activism, which is something that needs to be discussed in the hopes that we can defer what it looks like as a professional student affairs professional to support our students without the fear of being chastised or penalized by losing our job. Unfortunately, none of these people are with this university anymore. Um, so allyship is what we should be aiming for. It's a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. Allyship is not self-defined. Our work and our efforts must be recognized by the people we seek to ally ourselves with. So the civil rights era was a gateway to student activism and student affairs should strive to be an ally to students. I think this is the best way for us to really console our students when they're dealing with traumatic experiences. I think this is also the best way um, for us to advocate on their behalf and um, help them navigate through the process of